Now, if Mosiah chapter 7 was Limhi teaching his people, in chapter 8, it's Ammon's turn to address the same group. Limhi introduces him in verse 1, and Ammon takes the stand in verse 2. He stands before them and rehearses unto them all that had happened unto their brethren from the time that Zenith went up out of the land, even until the, li- the time that he himself came up out of the land. Again, this is two generations worth of history that these people have completely missed, but that Ammon knows they would be interested in. These are your people. These are your brethren. I want to hear your story. Don't you want to hear theirs? I remember early on in our marriage, my wife and I moved into my grandpa's old house in an old part of the Salt Lake Valley where the church was very well established, but there was an incredible amount of less active members. Sure enough, when I got my first home teaching assignment, it was to people I didn't know and, as chance would have it, people that didn't want to have anything to do with the church. Well, what was I supposed to do? After making it a matter of prayer and pondering, I realized that most of these less actives have lived here for ages, surrounded by other people who have lived there just as long. And I thought, they know these people. I'm new here. I don't know the less actives. I don't know the actives. They're all strangers to me. But I have a feeling that the less actives that I don't know do know the active members that I don't know. And so I started putting together each week something I called Church in a Nutshell. And what it was, was I I kept it to one page and tried to make just a one-page flyer to let them know this is what church was like today. I would include a brief synopsis of the talks that were given or list some of the people that bore powerful testimonies on a fast and testimony meeting. My hope was name recognition, that somebody would see this church in a nutshell left on their door after church on a Sunday and have the curiosity to just look it over and hopefully see some names that they recognized. So-and-so gave a talk today. I remember so-and-so. I served with them in a Relief Society presidency. Or so-and-so got a new calling. I remember that person. They taught me when I was young. I just wanted to rehearse unto them what was going on in the church in hopes that there would be interest and recognition and hopefully good memories that would come flooding back. In verse 3, he also rehearsed unto them the words of King Benjamin. There was something you missed in your time away that was life-changing. And I just want to give you another chance to get up to speed on that. He explains those words to the people of King Limhi. He made sure that they understood all of those words. Some things we do forget in time away. But to have someone kindly rehearse things, and not just rehearse them, explain them, Help us understand them. They may come to know more about the gospel and better understand it on that return trip than ever they did the first time they were active. And we can help them with that. Once they're caught up to speed in verse 4, King Limhi dismisses them and they go back to their homes. But Limhi is not done with Ammon. He brings Ammon and gives him the records of his own people, the records of Zenith, which are about to start reading ourselves, so that Ammon can be brought up to speed with what's been occurring among this particular people. But as Ammon is reading these things in verse 6 and 7, all of a sudden, King Limhi thinks, wait a minute, there's some more reading that really needs to be done. Do you know of anybody that can interpret languages? Limhi asks him in verse 6. And here's the reason why. In verse 7, we tried to find our way back to you at one point. That's a beautiful insight into many people that are not active in the church attempts that they have made previously to come back, a desire that was there. It just didn't work for them for whatever reason. But that's an amazing part of our inquiry to hear stories about people who I was this close to coming back. I got dressed on a Sunday morning. I drove to church and I just couldn't bring myself to cross the threshold. I was so afraid of being judged or stared at that I wouldn't be welcome. I've heard stories like that of people that were this close to coming back, but couldn't. Well, in this attempt, they went in search of the land of Zarahemla and couldn't find it. In verse 8, they were lost in the wilderness, but they were diligent. They're doing the best they can with what they've got to try to find their way back home. They're just unsuccessful. What ends up happening for them, they come to this land covered with the bones of men, covered with ruins of buildings. And while they're there, they discover this set of plates, golden plates, 24, filled with engravings. 
They bring back other evidences of the civilization that they discovered that had been lost, but they can't read the engravings on the plates that they found. So King Limhi asks Ammon at the end of verse 11, canst thou translate? Or in verse 12, do you know anyone who can? I want to know what's on these records. It wasn't just curiosity's sake, by the way. Notice one of Limhi's specific questions in 12. I am desirous to know the cause of their destruction. Now, this is a king who's been fighting to preserve his own people against the attacks of the Lamanites. If there's one thing he knows, it's the danger of destruction. He finds the records of a group of people that succumbed to that and wants to know, how did it happen? How can I avoid that? He wondered if these plates would be a cautionary tale for him and his own people. Again, there's this sense that I'm far from where I should be and I'm staring possible destruction in the face. How do I avoid that? How do I come home? In their failed attempts to return to the faith, they might not find their way home, but they might find greater and greater cause to figure it out. Other evidences of destruction or things that they are potentially facing as they go down similar paths. It's as if King Limhi is saying, please help me make sense of my own experience. I don't know what's happening to my people. I don't know what happened to these other people. I think there are connections here. Help me make sense of my own experience. And I think that's one thing that less actives are crying out for. I'm far from God. I can't make sense of everything that I'm going through. Please help me understand my experience and help save me from it. In Ammon's response, we see a beautiful lesson on the blessings of having prophets, seers, and revelators. A blessing that Limhi and his people had not had for three generations. Ammon says to him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man that can translate the records, for he hath wherewith that he can look. He has something. He calls it a gift from God. He says they are called interpreters, and no man can look in them except he be commanded. Whoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer. With two E's. It technically should have three. A seer. Now this is the first hint that we have of the Urim and Thummim. It's mentioned in conjunction with the brother of Jared. It's mentioned in the tra translation process of the Book of Mormon with Joseph Smith. And some people really struggle with this translation aspect of ancient records. The Urim and Thummim is described as some kind of transparent stones that were fixed into a bow and connected to the breastplate. Joseph Smith also talked about having a seer stone that he had used to assist him in the translation of the Book of Mormon. There are various processes that Joseph Smith followed, not the same at each time or in each act of translation. And Joseph himself never really explained the process. He was asked to once and he simply responded, it's from the gift and power of God. Just like we see in verse 13, it is a gift from God. I can't understand the mechanics myself, but it's something that helps me see. Now, whether it's Urim and Thummim or seer stones, before we scratch our heads and get too confused over this, I'm amazed at how often in scripture, and even in our own church life ourselves, God will give us some kind of a, a training wheel, some kind of a crutch to help us fix our faith on something to help us see the invisible in something visible before us. Can priesthood blessings be given without consecrated oil? Yes. But we use that. Not that the oil itself is what heals someone, but it does help us, both the giver of the blessing and the receiver of the blessing, center our faith on the atonement of Jesus Christ. Gethsemane does mean olive press, right? And so to just help us symbolize and see something happening. I've often asked my students, when Jesus heals the man that is blind, when he spits on the ground into the clay and mixes the clay and the spittle to anoint his eyes and then tells him to wash in the pool of Siloam, which of those elements caused the healing? Was it the clay? Was it the spit? Was it the water from the pool? And of course the answer is D, none of the above. It was the power of God that healed him. Then why all this stuff? Why the laying on of hands? Why the 16 stones for the brother of Jared? Couldn't Jesus just make it glow inside those barges? Sure, he could have. But we mere mortals often need tangible things to center our faith on the intangible realities that they're meant to represent. 
I'm grateful that God gives us gifts that help remind us of the spiritual gifts that God is really giving us. In ancient Israel, the Urim and Thummim were part of that high priestly clothing that's described in the book of Exodus. A means to help that high priest receive revelation from God. In this case, the Urim and Thummim, these interpreters, were meant to help a seer see things that would not be seeable to someone without the gift of faith that this gift of God was meant to symbolize. By the way, this isn't just some weird aspect of early Mormonism. Take a look at the insignia of Yale University. And what do you see on its shield? A, an open book. The scriptures. The word of God whereby light and truth come into our lives. Underneath it on this scroll, Lux et Veritas. Light and truth. Which the Doctrine and Covenant says is the glory of God. Intelligence. Or in other words, Lux et Veritas. And for anyone who can read Hebrew, what is written on that open Bible? Urim Vatumim, Urim and Thummim. That's what it says on the insignia of one of the oldest and most well-respected universities in this country. Established by Puritans who believed in an open Bible, who believed in receiving light and truth, who believed in Urim and Thummim, lights and perfections. That's what God is offering Joseph Smith. That's what God is offering King Mosiah. In fact, it's what he's offering all of us. Means whereby we might see light and truth in its perfection that we wouldn't be able to understand in any other way. Now, when King Limhi realizes that there's actually someone in Zarahemla that has this high gift from God, verse 14, then in 15 he exclaims, a seer must be greater than a prophet. Prophet is usually our go-to word, right? We sing, follow the prophet. We thank the O God for a prophet. They're prophets. But even greater than a prophet is a seer because it includes that other title. In verse 16, Ammon says, a seer is a revelator and a prophet also. And a gift which is greater can no man have. Elder Holland once said, it's no small thing to claim prophethood and seership and revelation. But in this church, we do claim those things because we have them, these great mighty gifts from God. God has given the church by calling prophets seers and revelators. A seer is best defined in verse 17 as one who can know of things which are past and know of things which are to come. By them shall all things be revealed, or rather shall secret things be made manifest, and hidden things shall come to light. Things which are not known shall be made known by them, and things which shall be made known by them which otherwise could not be known. That last phrase to me is the best description of what a seer can do. Teach us things that others just can't teach us, because they are able to see things that the rest of us just can't see. In my studies of anti-Mormonism, I'm amazed that recently some of the biggest issues that people have as they leave the church or fight against it have to do with translation issues through the seer, Joseph Smith. They question the Book of Mormon. More frequently, they question the historicity of the Book of Abraham, specifically because there are Egyptologists that have studied the fragments of the papyri that were discovered and say this has nothing to do with what Joseph Smith invented in the book of Abraham. Now there's a whole history behind this story and all kinds of different explanations that go back and forth. I don't mean to detract from the great work that Egyptologists do, but their approach is different. They are scholars and not seers. Theirs was a Rosetta stone rather than a seer stone. And both of those can produce wonderfully beautiful and accurate translations of things. But the translation of a scholar is not and cannot be the translation of a seer. Seers reveal things which otherwise could not be known. It's why, according to Isaiah's prophecy and Charles Anthon's experience, scholars cannot read sealed books because they cannot see certain things that to their scholarly mind are required for translation to unfold. But for the unlearned seer, Sight is possible in things that could otherwise not be made known. 
In fact, to me, it even comes back to the difference between translation and interpretation. We talk about, and even Joseph talked about, translating by the gift and power of God. Translator was one of Joseph's key titles. It reminds me of an experience I had training a group of teachers, and there were some deaf teachers included in the group. So, not knowing American Sign Language myself, I had some translators. At least that's what I thought they were called. I went and did my thing. I taught, and out of the corner of my eye would watch them sign. It's always, I've loved that. I think it's beautiful. But afterwards, I went to thank them for their hard work, and I apologized to them. I said, I'm so sorry that you had to translate for me because I speak a mile a minute and just trying to, I've tried to translate on my mission and elsewhere. It's so hard. And especially when this person speaks fast and they smiled and corrected me in two ways. They said, well, first of all, we're so grateful you talked fast. There was so much information there. We don't try to translate word for word. That would be impossible. We're trying to get a sense of what you're saying. And the more words you use, the more material we have to work with. That helped me understand the second correction they gave me. They said, we're not translating. We're not called translators. We're called interpreters. We're taking what you are trying to convey and then we're interpreting it in hopes that our audience will be able to receive the same kinds of impressions that you're trying to convey. That's all interpretation is. Come to think of it, that's all translation is either. In many ways, translators are required to choose between the literal word for word on the page or the sense of what is trying to be conveyed. It's like translating poetry and trying to get it to rhyme in the new language also. It cannot be done exact word for word. There needs to be a spirit or a sense that is being conveyed. And when those sign language interpreters told me that, my mind immediately went to the Urim and Thummim. Because what were they called here? Interpreters. People who get their faith tied up in knots over specific words or language in the Book of Mormon or over issues in the Book of Abraham or challenges in the Joseph Smith translation. I'm not sure if translation was the right word to ever use to begin with. At least not anymore. In Joseph Smith's day, translation was a perfect word. Because the sense of changing from one language to another in the 1828 dictionary was the sixth of seven definitions for the term. The sixth one. The way Webster originally defined it, the sixth definition of translate was to interpret or to render into another language, to express the sense of one language in the words of another. Again, notice Webster's emphasis on the sense of the language instead of just specific vocabulary. But even that is the sixth definition. What's the first definition of translate? To bear, carry, or remove from one place to another. The second, to remove or convey to heaven. That's why we talk about translated beings. When I was a kid, I never understood why we used that word. A translated being? It's like, what language do they go from to to what other language? No, it's a being that is conveyed to heaven. The third definition to transfer or convey from one to another. Isn't that what we're trying to do in translating divine truth? Things that cannot be known or seen in any other way? How else am I going to take heaven and bring it down to earth? Which Brigham Young said was one of Joseph Smith's great gifts. He was a true translator in that respect. The fourth definition, to cause to remove from one part of the body to another. The fifth definition, to change the sixth I already listed, and then the seventh to explain. I honestly think that's what Joseph was getting at when he said in the eighth article of faith that we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. Some people who've looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls or other ancient manuscripts look and think, this is as close to what we have in the King James or other translations of the Bible as we get. It seems to have been translated correctly. Well, that doesn't seem to be Joseph's big concern. What did he say in Joseph Smith history? The teachers of the various sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. It's they explained it so differently. They understood it so differently. And it's those acts of translation that can be far from accurate. Are we explaining truth well? Are we translating it into terms that we can understand and live by? 
As Joseph once said in a sermon in Nauvoo where he was trying to explain some of the epistles of Peter, he said, the things that are in Scripture are only hints of what existed in the prophet's mind. Hints. In other words, I'm trying to translate things. I'm trying to give you the sense of what a prophet was only hinting at. In some ways, I'm trying to eliminate the middleman and get back to the source of original truth, God himself. And seers can do that. It's not scholarly translation in some kind of word-for-word -word exchange. In section 21, when Joseph Smith is given titles from the Lord, three of them were prophet, seer, and what would we fill in the blank with? Well, every time in conference when we sustain the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, we do so as prophets, seers, and revelators. But Joseph was, was sustained as a prophet, seer, and translator. Well, if translation and revelation are the ones in question, perhaps those are more synonymous than we typically assume. That translation is interpretation and that it is revelation through and through. King Mosiah has the interpreters, a gift from God, a tangible gift to help him center his spiritual gift on the task at hand. No wonder that kind of a seer is even greater than a prophet, one who can foretell and more frequently forthtell things that need to be clearly known. As Ammon sums it up in verse 18, Thus God hath provided a means that man, through faith, might work mighty miracles. Therefore he becometh a great benefit to his fellow man. That's the reason God works this way. He takes man, regular, mortal, imperfect, fallen man, and gives him means, a Urim and Thummim, a seer stone, a vial of oil, some clay and spittle, so that that mere man can exercise faith in the invisible power of God, such that they can work mighty miracles, and in so doing, greatly benefit their fellow beings. Call it a crutch, it's helping me walk. Call it training wheels, it's allowing me to ride. Doubt translations, mock stones and hats, but they are allowing me to see things that I would never have been able to see otherwise. No wonder King Limhi rejoices in verse 20. Oh, how marvelous are the works of the Lord. How long doth he suffer with his people? He's put up with us for these last three generations. Yea, and how blind and impenetrable are the understandings of the children of men compared to the sight of a spiritual seer. For they will not seek wisdom, neither do they desire that she should rule over them. That's been our problem for three generations now. Grandpa Zenith would not seek wisdom or allow her to rule over him. In his overzealousness, he had to do things his way. My father, Noah, wanted nothing to do with divine wisdom and certainly wouldn't allow any of it to rule over him or his people. And here we have been, even in our attempts to find our way back, our blindness and impenetrable understanding has kept us from finding our way home. And yet now God has provided means for us Ammon, someone who can see his way back to Zarahemla. And if we'll follow him, we'll obtain the objects of our desires. We'll come home. Otherwise, we'll remain what we have been. Verse 21, a wild flock which fleeth from the shepherd. Flees from the very person that's trying to bring us home. Flees directly into the devouring fangs and claws of the beasts of the forest. Precisely those things that the Good Shepherd was trying to protect us from all along. Thank God for seers. If we have the eyes to see them for who they are. Now chapter 8 ends there. And chapter 9 begins this flashback two generations before. How did they get into this mess? Chapter 7 and 8, this is their attempts to get out of it. How did they get into it in the first place? Notice what the story says in chapter 9. 
Verse 1, I, Zenith, having been taught in all the language of the Nephites, and having had a knowledge of the land of Nephi, or of the land of our father's first inheritance, he was sent as a spy among the Lamanites to spy out their forces so that the Nephite army could come upon them and destroy them. That's his mission. But that mission didn't quite go according to plan, because notice what happens at the end of verse 1. Zenith says, when I saw that which was good among the Lamanites, I was desirous that they should not be destroyed. Now, there's a couple of ways we can look at that. We can look at it negatively as if he's, you know, justifying wickedness, for example. I know this is wrong. We're supposed to destroy this. We're supposed to root out the Lamanites from this area. But there's just, ah, there's some redeeming features. I think we do that sometimes. Sometimes we get ourselves into trouble because we see wickedness, but we rationalize it and justify it. We see that there are some desirable things And we don't want to destroy it, at least not completely. Now that's the negative view. There's a more positive view. If perhaps Zenith is more of a peacemaker, so that rather than seeing this as an example of justification or rationalization, perhaps it's a question of holy envy. That there is goodness here. Jacob had some of that for the Lamanites. Back in Jacob chapter 3, when he compares the wickedness and adulteries of his own people to the chastity and family unity of the Lamanites. Jacob saw something positive in his peers and left room for a holy envy. So perhaps Zenith is doing the same. We don't know for sure, historically, which of those two is, the, is accurate. And in some ways it doesn't matter. Our purpose, again, is not merely to reconstruct history. It's to live our lives according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we find a principle in either version of the story? I think we can. So take them both and live those principles. Do not justify wickedness. Destroy it. But also leave room for holy envy in people that may not live or believe or worship in the same way that you do. Either way, negative or positive, there are other people in this commando mission, other people in this group that do not see things the way Zenith sees them. And so they contend with one another. And it's not just any kind of contention. This is civil war, basically, among this scouting expedition. Father against father, brother against brother, until the greater number of their army is destroyed. Now, there's a few things we need to make sense of here. First of all, did they just kind of peter out and go, okay, um, we're all killing each other off. Can we just pause and lick our wounds and go back to Zarahemla with our tail between our legs? Perhaps. But if this is father against father and brother against brother, that's a level of intensity in opposition to one another. It's breaking apart families. That that doesn't seem like it's going to be quick to call a truce halfway through. I wonder instead if it's the opposition has been destroyed. There's only one side now, and it's the winners. And they're the ones that are going to tell the story. They're the ones that are going to go back to Zarahemla, gather more people that are like-minded, and then go do what they had decided to do or wanted to do from the beginning. Notice also one of the things we learn about the leader. In the middle of verse 2, Zenith describes him, and again, this is oppositional, but Zenith describes him as, being an austere and a bloodthirsty man. There was no love lost between these two, right? This bloodthirsty leader wanted Zenith slain. Now remember, what did we already know about Zenith? One of the little details we caught in the previous chapter. Zenith was overzealous. And this other leader, he is austere. Sounds like they both have some bloodthirsty issues in terms of fighting and shedding much blood. But think about the conflict between one person who is overzealous and another person who is austere. This is a bad combination. Also, the fact that neither one of them is very Christ-like in their attributes. Slow to remember the Lord their God is a phrase that was used earlier. Bloodthirsty and contentious are words that we see here. Now, overzealousness and austerity are just one way to split a group of people into opposing parties. There are many other ways to draw lines of division where contention will result. 
Historically, within denominationalism, for example, it's always been the Baptists against the Methodists, against the Presbyterians, and so on. Joseph Smith describes that in Joseph Smith history during that revival period preceding the first vision. But in our day, we're seeing a split along different lines, not between denominations, but within denominations. And it's typically against people who want to change things, to become more modern, and people who want to keep things the way they were liberals and conservatives, to the point that now a liberal Presbyterian has more in common with a liberal Methodist than he does with a conservative Presbyterian. You take these denominational silos and cut them all along political lines, really, with all the conservatives of multiple denominations agreeing with each other and disagreeing with their own denominational counterparts that are across the political aisle. This austere leader wants to follow orders. We're sent to destroy. There's only one way of doing things. It's the Nephite way, and we have to eliminate the enemy. Meanwhile, Zenith sees the positive among them and says, no, th forget the letter of the law, let's do the spirit of the law. Or why do we have to follow orders when we're seeing perhaps a better way of doing things ourselves? Now, I'm not saying who is right or who is wrong here. What I am saying is that we need each other and we mustn't allow our differences to devolve into a fight of father against father or brother against brother or we'll end up destroying ourselves and the church that is meant for us all to become one in Christ. I'm grateful for differing perspectives in my ward, in my family, in the Quorum of the Twelve. It doesn't bother me that Brigham Young and Orson Pratt didn't see eye to eye on everything. It doesn't bother me. In fact, it reassures me that when Jesus Christ chose his original 12 apostles, he included Simon the Zealot and Matthew the Publican in the same quorum. Someone who hated Rome and someone who worked for Rome. And Jesus basically saying, figure it out and get along. We need all perspectives here. Beware of demonizing the other because eventually you'll end up destroying one another. Back to chapter 9. In verse 3, Zenith admits, I was overzealous to inherit the land of my fathers. I wanted things the way they used to be. Perhaps he disagreed with Mosiah's decision at the beginning to leave this area and go to what became the land of Zarahemla. And he wasn't alone in that. He gathered whoever would come, and they went. But they were smitten with famine, sore afflictions, for they were slow to remember the Lord their God. Well, eventually they find their way to the land of Nephi. They go and meet the king in verse 5 and want to find his disposition. Is there any hope for us to come and possess the land? Well, good news. It seemed like it. In verse 6, the king covenanted with Zenith. The land is all yours. In fact, I will clear out my own people in verse 7 so you can have it. In verse 8, they begin to build buildings, they repair the walls. In 9, they till the ground, they multiply and prosper. Evidently, these were not things that were happening when it was under Lamanite control. And King Laman seems to know that. In verse 10, it was his cunning and his craftiness in order to bring Zenith's people into bondage that he allowed those things to happen in the first place. It wasn't altruism that was motivating him. It was greed. It wasn't, oh, I'll clear out my people and let you move in. It's, I'm going to get rid of the unproductive so I can have a bigger tax base with these productive Nephites. We have to be careful for the sweet deals that the adversary sometimes offers us. Well, just like Pharaoh in verse 10, King Laman is now nervous about these multiplied Nephites among his people. This is what we see in Exodus chapter 1, right? With this Pharaoh that knew not Joseph and is concerned about the multiplication of the Israelites. So in verse 11, King Laman begins to grow uneasy lest Zenith's people could be stronger than he and overpower him. After all, verse 12, the Lamanites were a lazy and an idolatrous people. So they wanted to glut themselves on the labors of other people's hands. That's an interesting connection. Lazy and idolatrous. You see that hinted at elsewhere in the Book of Mormon when it talks about the Lamanites. There seems to be a parallel between idleness, I-D-L-E, 
N-E-S-S, and idleness, I-D-O-L-N-E-S-S. We call it idolatry. But for memory's sake, idleness leads to idleness because you end up worshiping a God that requires nothing from you as opposed to its opposite, where true worship requires real work, an effort to overcome our sins or our natural man tendencies, work to reconcile our will to the will of God rather than the will of the devil or of the flesh, as King Benjamin said. Keep an eye out for that in the Book of Mormon. Again, the parallels between idleness and idleness and the parallels between worship and work. So King Laman begins to stir up his people They begin fighting the people of Zenith. And yet in verse 17, in the strength of the Lord, we went forth to battle against the Lamanites. I and my people did cry mightily to the Lord that he would deliver us out of the hands of our enemies. For we were awakened to a remembrance of the deliverance of our fathers. Awakened suggests that they had fallen asleep. And like he admitted way back in verse 3, we were slow to remember. Well, now they've been woken up into remembrance. We need God. And we don't have him. What can we do to get him on our side? Thankfully, for their sake, God was quick to respond. Verse 18, he heard their cries, answered their prayers. They went forth in his might and they won. But the story doesn't end there. It never does. You're still in enemy territory. We might think that all is well. We've established peace. We're prospering. And yet, until we come home, to Zarahemla, where the prophet is, where that seer resides. Our peace and our prosperity will be temporary at best. We've got to come home. And though Zenith doesn't realize that, and Noah denies it, Limhi begins to see it crystal clear and does all he can to return. In chapter 10, the story continues. Verse 1, they again begin to possess the land in peace. And yet, knowing that this peace will be temporary, as I just said, King Zenith begins to make weapons of war of every kind. Verse 2, he sets guards round about. He'd been lulled into a false sense of security with this cunning craftiness of King Laman. Well, not anymore. Weapons, guards, preparation. But notice, not an abandonment of the originally flawed plan. No desire to return to Zarahemla where they were supposed to be. Still a sense that, no, we can make it work here. And it seems to. Verse 3 through 5, for the next 22 years, all is well. See, it's fine to live in Lamanite territory. We don't have to be with the body of the church back in Zarahemla. It's fine here. So we had a a bad year. But 22 good ones, that's not bad. Do we sense that this awakened people is starting to fall back to sleep again? I had a fascinating conversation with someone who had decided to leave the church for a while is the way he described it. He said, I just plan on going on sabbatical for a while, which is a term that I've often heard. Take a little break from the church. The way he described it was, I grew up in the church. This is all I've ever known. I don't really know if it's making much of a difference for me or not. And so I just want to try the experiment. What would it be like if I leave? And will my life all of a sudden fall apart and be worse because I don't have the church in it? I said, okay, I can understand where you're coming from. I get the logic behind your experiment. But if you plan on making this experiment, like you're describing, make sure that you have a control group in terms of analysis in various conditions. What I mean by that is, if you're going to be away from God, make sure you see what it's like, not only in the good times, but in the bad times too. If life is easy right now, and continues to remain easy in the future. You might not feel much of a difference between having God in your life and not having God in your life. Being surrounded by a community of saints that's here to help you, and, or not being surrounded by that community. But when things get hard, you may begin to recognize a few differences. If I'm carrying around an umbrella during sunny days, I may not know if this umbrella is very protective or not. But once it starts to rain, I'll be able to see the difference really, really well. Just be aware of the same. It was their hard times that woke them up to their need for God. And those hard times, even 22 years of sunshine notwithstanding, 
the hard times would return again. Sure enough, as soon as King Laman dies, his son, who had similar goals but perhaps was a little less cunning and crafty and much more bold and bloodthirsty instead, sends spies in and then armies until there's a battle like they'd never seen before. In verse 10, Zenith's people go up to battle against them, even he in his old age, and they went up in the strength of the Lord to battle. That's the good news. Remember, this is still first generation in Hansen's law. We haven't met second generation rejection in Noah yet. This is the original immigrant. I remember life in Zarahemla. I know the Lord. I know of his strength and recognize our need for it. He's still holding on to those righteous traditions. He's just doing it in enemy territory. And who's to say if the next generation will follow in his footsteps or not? We'll see that next week. Because the people that that next generation will still be surrounded by, verse 11, knows nothing concerning the Lord, nor his strength. Now they depended instead upon their own strength, which is what Noah will do also. Now, that was a lot of strength, Zenith admits in verse 11. They were strong. They had a lot of strength of man. But even that was nothing compared to the strength of God that Zenith's people were relying upon. Now, almost for the rest of this chapter, Zenith does us a great favor. He describes the Lamanites in a way that a good historian would to try to help them see this is what got them to where they are. This is the culture behind this civilization. It's incredibly insightful to see why the Lamanites are the way they are. Verse 12, they were a wild and ferocious and bloodthirsty people, believing in the tradition of their fathers. So it seems to result from, well, we know this from President Packer's famous statement about behavior versus belief, right? Our behaviors grow out of our beliefs. So why are the Lamanites behaving in wild, ferocious, bloodthirsty ways? Because they believe certain traditions. And this is what these traditions are. Believing that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers. Now, not the iniquities of their fathers as in Laman and Lemuel. It's their wicked. No. The iniquities of Nephi and Lehi is what brought us out of Jerusalem to begin with. We could have still been there. And then they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren. They were wronged while crossing the sea. They were wronged while in the land of their first inheritance once they got here. Now here, Zenith interrupts himself and gives the Nephite version. Well, all this because Nephi was more faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord, so he was favored by God. But from a Lamanite perspective, no. Nephi was wicked because he wronged our fathers on at least three different occasions. Wronged them in the wilderness, wronged them on the boat, wronged them here in the promised land. Notice, it's nothing that the Lamanites themselves did. It's what was done to them. These are, this is victimhood mentality if I've ever seen it. This is, we were objects instead of agents in our own wickedness. It was Lehi and Nephi that wronged Laman and Lemuel. And it's been the Nephites that have wronged us Lamanites ever since. And once you start blaming others for your situation, and instead of taking any responsibility yourself, then it's easy for the wronged, wronged, wronged to become the wrath, wrath, wrath of the next three verses. Verse 14, his brethren were wroth because they understood not the dealings of the Lord. That, by the way, is exactly what Nephi said about Laman and Lemuel back in 1 Nephi chapter 2. That they murmured about having to leave Jerusalem because they knew not the dealings of that God who created them. Same thing here generations and generations later. They still don't understand what God is doing. 14 continues, they were wroth with him upon the waters because they hardened their hearts against the Lord. 15, they were wroth with him when they arrived in the promised land because they said he'd taken the ruling out of, the, of the people out of their hands. And 16, wroth with him when he departed into the wilderness because he took the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass. They said he robbed them. Robbed them of something they didn't want to begin with? Remember, Laman and Lemuel didn't want anything to do with the brass plates. They were murmuring their whole way back. Who finally obtained them? Nephi did. Who searched them from the beginning? Lehi did. Who valued these words? The Nephites, those that knew God had spoken and who treasured those words. The best place to see this in that initial generation is back in 1 Nephi chapter 17 when they're building the ship. 
Again, this is something that hundreds of years later, the Lamanites are still licking their wounds about or nursing their grievances. It all centered on the first stories of their first fathers. In chapter 17, verse 21, Laman and Lemuel say, These many years we have suffered in the wilderness. By the way, one chapter earlier, the women who were struggling with in childbirth and nursing newborns in the wilderness, living off raw meat, they had stopped murmuring. They had toughened up to the point that they weren't complaining about things. And yet, Laman and Lemuel, these manly men, so to speak, are still whining about suffering in the wilderness. Keep going in 21. Which time we might have enjoyed our possessions and the land of our inheritance. Yea, we might have been happy. Still no belief that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed for its wickedness. No, we could have kept our stuff. Laman was the firstborn. He stood to gain a double portion. The way he saw it, he had lost twice as much as Nephi had. And if he would only have been permitted to stay in Jerusalem, he would have been happy there. No fear of consequence for any sin, because he didn't see any sin there. 22 clarifies that. For we know that the people who were in the land of of Jerusalem were a righteous people. Wow, they saw their peers in far different terms than Lehi had when he cried repentance back at the beginning of the book. How were they judging things? 22, they kept the statutes and judgments of the Lord and all his commandments according to the law of Moses. So we know they were a righteous people. That's amazing to me. We'll see more of this with the priests of Noah next week. Laman and Lemuel consider their peers in Jerusalem righteous because they kept the law of Moses. What part of the law? Sounds like only the ceremonial part. They weren't keeping commandments, but they were offering sacrifice. Forget the broken heart and contrite spirit. I've got a lamb or an ox to give. Forget the sacrifice of sin. Will you take the sacrifice of sheep? Good enough. And then even more classic, and our father hath judged them. It's interesting to watch people struggle in their faith because they feel judged. I've heard it so many times where you talk with somebody who's far from the church and they go, oh, Latter-day Saints are so judgmental. As there they sit in their own judgmentalness regarding every Latter-day Saint. Often I'll just gently try to call them out on that and go, wait, 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 have you felt judged by me? Well, no, but I'm a Latter-day Saint. Are you not judging them by calling them all judgmental? Still, that feeling of judgment is a tough one to swallow. They they then say in 22, And hath led us away because we would hearken unto his words. This is the first time they hint at any mistake on their own part. But it's this sense of, I can't believe we were so stupid to follow them. You hear that sometimes when people leave the church also. I was duped. I can't believe I fell for that whole stupid thing. And those wrongs are then nursed into wrath and anger. In chapter 18, when they're on the boat, which was another thing that the later generations were still nursing. In verse 10, when they bind Nephi with cords, Laman and Lemuel treat him with harshness and say, we will not that our younger brother shall be a ruler over us. It really was all about authority. And I will not have a younger brother tell me what to do. In fact, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, because even my father, I didn't want him to tell me what to do either. So often in our struggles, there is this tug of war, this wrestle with authority, and an unwillingness to submit or to allow anyone else to tell us what to do. You see that back uh, two chapters in 16, where Laman and Lemuel say, Let us slay our father and our brother Nephi, who has taken it upon him to be our ruler and our teacher, who are his elder brethren. That's not something Nephi took upon him. He didn't want it. Earlier on, he even said, Why are you making me, your younger brother, set an example to you? This is a younger brother that would have preferred his elder brothers to live up to their responsibility. And yet, Those older brothers say to him in verse 38, Now he says that the Lord has talked with him, and also that angels have ministered unto him. I can't believe the forgetfulness there. Nephi is making up angelic ministration. You were there in the cave when the angel came and broke up the family feud. You've had angels minister unto you too. How quickly we forget. 
But behold, we know that he lies unto us and tells us these things. And he worketh many things by his cunning arts that he may deceive our eyes. I really wonder if they were referring to the Liahona there, which dad had just found earlier on in that chapter. Some have suggested that Nephi himself was probably a gifted metal worker. When he first unsheathes Laban's sword, he comments on its construction. When God tells him to build a boat, he simply asks where the ore can be found for him to be able to make tools to then fashion the timbers. Nephi seemed to take a lot of shop classes in junior high and high school. He seemed to know that side well. And so you wonder if Laman and Lemuel are saying, oh, he even worked this mysterious, this cunning art in this ball that always seems to do what Nephi wants to do. And it always works for him, but it won't work for us. Just one more example of him deceiving us so that we'll follow him. Again, I can't believe I'm so stupid that I got duped by this. Continuing in 38, he thinks to make himself a king and a ruler over us that he may do with us according to his will and pleasure. That's their biggest concern. He just wants to do with us what he wants. Where Nephi hasn't seemed to be doing anything that he's wanted, he's simply doing what the Lord wants. Same with his father, Lehi. One other place to see it is 2 Nephi 5, when the two groups separate from one another. In verse 3, Laman and Lemuel murmur against Nephi, saying, Our younger brother thinks to rule over us, and we have had much trial because of him. He was the source of their trials? More like they were the source of his. Remember back when the Nephi breaks his bow, and everybody's murmuring, even Dad, about the hunger pains and not having enough food to eat? Well, Nephi even says, maybe tongue-in-cheek, that his brethren were afflicted out of hunger, and that he was afflicted with his brethren. I, I love that little slip, perhaps, from Nephi. But no, they say, we've had much trial because of him. Now let us slay him that we may not be afflicted more because of his words. It's his words. It's his teachings. That's what he's using to rule over and teach us. We don't want to have anything to do with those. All of this was the source of their feeling wronged and being wroth back in Mosiah chapter 10. By the way, doesn't that sound like Lucifer in pre-mortality? He was wronged because the father's plan was preferred over his. He was wronged that the firstborn was chosen instead of him, the son of the morning. Read the Abraham account. They both said the same thing. Here am I, send me. He, the first one just said it right before I did. No one would have lost if my plan had been followed. I was wronged. God didn't want me to become like him. He's still nursing that wound when he casts those aspersions towards Adam and Eve. Oh, don't eat the fruit. He won't let you eat the fruit because he knows in the day you eat of it, you'll be just like him. You'll know. And heaven forbid God want anyone to become like him when that was God's plan all along. No, for Lucifer, it was, I was wronged, I was wronged, I was wronged. And as a result, I am wroth and will remain wroth forever after. From that moment on, chapter 10, verse 17 of Mosiah, they taught their children to hate Nephites, to murder them, to rob them, to plunder them. No wonder there was an eternal hatred toward the children of Nephi. They imbibed it on their mother's knee. I think it was Ann Madsen, Truman G. Madsen's wife, after years of the two of them living in Jerusalem, and someone asked, when will there be peace in the Middle East? I believe she said, it'll only come when mothers teach their children to love instead of to hate. But this eternal hatred that the Lamanites felt toward the Nephites is because they were taught from infancy to hate the people that had wronged them from the very beginning. Sadly, I think the hardest people to help return to the faith will be those that have been nursing wounds that they might not even have suffered themselves, but who keep telling themselves stories, whether invented by themselves or by others, perhaps with an element of truth at their core, but taken to a certain extreme that hatred is the result, a hatred that you can't even be talked out of. 
because it was never rational to begin with. So often it's the stories that we tell ourselves, flawed and fictional as they may be, but reality according to our own perception that colors the way we view everything else and keeps us from making changes that would bless our lives eternally. It was that eternal hatred that in verse 18 was driving King Laman's cunning and lying craftiness, even his fair promises that were nothing but pure deception so that eventually he could destroy enemies he had hated from the very beginning. It reminds me of Korahor in Alma 30. Satan seems to have made many a fair promise to him about certain things. And yet when he was finally undeceived, did Satan come rushing to his rescue? Saying, oh, you've been such a profitable servant. Let me support you in the last day. No. Korahor is trodden underfoot. And what's Mormon's takeaway? What's his thus we see at the end? Thus we see that Satan does not support his children at the last day, but does speedily drag their souls down to hell. There's no love loss between the master and his servants on that side of the factory floor. Even fair promises are nothing but deception. Still, on Zenith's side, verse 19, he rallies his troops, stimulates them to go to battle with their might, putting their trust in the Lord. Thankfully, he still remembered his traditions well enough to do that. And as a result, in verse 20, they drive them out of the land and emerge victorious. And yet, they remain. We can stay here and fight and win our battles. But at what point will we decide to quit fighting them and just give in to them? Wouldn't that be easier here in Lamanite territory? A win in Rome, do as the Romans do kind of a thing? Well, that's one generation away. Where the preservation of the first generation morphs into the rejection of the second. The overzealousness of the father becoming the complete undercommitment of the son. His story, Noah's story, will come next week. And it's a fascinating one. As you see creation in this come to fall and really stagnate there under the reign of this wicked King Noah. Keep an eye out for it as you move forward in your own study this week. I hope that you'll still keep an eye out for lessons to be learned about our own journeys away from God and returning to him. All of these things are so relevant to those who stray which includes all of us. In the meantime, I invite you to think about those that you know and care about who may have strayed into enemy territory. Do you know anything that has happened to them since they left? Are you willing to inquire after them, even if it requires a measure of boldness that you fear you might not have? I testify that they are our brethren and that down deep, so many of them still feel the same way about those who never wandered away. May we reach out to them in love, in compassion. May we show them the way to come home because home is where so many of them long to be. They just need help getting there.